So for any of you that was wondering about um, the uh, Miss Universe pageant and wondering why, how come all the winners are from Earth, <laughs> Seth might have an answer. <laughs> so let's please welcome Seth Shostak. <laughs> I'm going, is this work? Yep. Okay, I'm going to use this microphone. This one kind of makes pops and rumbles and thumps and stuff like that. I want to thank Jim and Beth for inviting me here. Uh, they made it clear to me that you have to be out of here by 10.30. So I'm going to... <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to bring slides to give you some sort of distraction from the aesthetic offense of having to look at me, but I thought you probably weren't adult enough for the sorts of things I was going to show, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to prattle at you for a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll give you an idea or two and provoke some questions after I'm done here. Uh, I'm going to tell you about something that I think is going to happen in this century, in fact in the next 20 years, and that is that we find some life beyond Earth. But that's one of three things that's going to happen, that I think are going to happen in this century, that are going to be transformative. The first thing, and it's dead obvious, this is the century of biology. We're finally understanding how life works. Uh, you right. I don't know that many of you have had your DNA sequenced, but in another 10 years, everybody will get their DNA sequenced. Right? Your doctor will simply have that information. The cost of doing that is falling by a factor of two essentially every year. So uh, we'll understand biology, and that'll lead to all sorts of interesting questions like, you know, do you want designer babies? And I know y'all thinking, I don't want designer babies. <laughs> but on the other hand, no if worries. you were the president and you went to see the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, look, you know, for 50 bucks more, the kid could have the same musical abilities as, I don't know, Beethoven or Elton John. What do you say? You want that? It's 50 bucks more. So you might say, okay, sign me up. <laughs> but it's going to be, you know, it cures for a lot of diseases and so forth. I uh, complained to my doctor that I'm too, I was born two generations too soon to benefit from the cure for death. Okay, <laughs> but that's, that's a very big thing. Uh, the second thing that I think is going to happen, we'll start moving out into space a little bit. There'll be some people who aren't going to be living on Earth. And uh, you might think, oh, well, that's good for them, kind of fun. Maybe they can send some interesting pictures, yes. But the real benefit is that if humans are dispersed, then it will be very hard to get rid of all of us. Okay, it's kind of a, an insurance policy against total self-destruction. Right? It's, it will be like ants. I can get rid of the ants in my kitchen with some difficulty, but I can't get rid of all ants because they're all over the place. Right? As soon as humans are occupying some other world or uh, floating orbital habitat in space, rotating aluminum cans in space, then I think it's virtually impossible to get rid of all of us, if you consider that somehow satisfying. Uh, the third thing that I want to mention is this. This is probably the most important. We'll invent our successors. Uh, and I'm talking here about artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of you, you know, if I ask you, do you think you could build an artificial kidney? Oh, well, you can do that. Artificial heart, sure. Uh, artificial pancreas, I don't know, but maybe. But if I say, what about an artificial brain that can teach high school chemistry, write the great American novel, whatever. Colin Colbert would be an interesting guess. Whatever. You know, a lot of you say, well, wait a minute, man, that's sacred. Why is it sacred? That's the organ between your ears. Otherwise, it's just another organ. Right? Okay. So, while it is controversial, and even within the artificial intelligence community, there are some people who say you'll never be able to replicate the cognitive capability of homo sapiens. There's some who say that, but most don't. I was up at Stanford. I, can I say Stanford in here, apparently? Yeah, no. no. I, don't, I don't have a dog in that fight, so I don't. Anyhow, uh, and, and I, was, I was up at the artificial intelligence lab, and the guy who had that was sitting there, and it was some TV shoot. And at some point during the break in the proceedings, I went up to the guy and I said, look, are we going to have a machine that can, you know, write War and Peace by 2050? And he looked up at me and he said, yes. Full extent of his answer. Now, once you do that, the next thing you do is you ask that machine to design something smarter than it is, and you build that. And then you use that machine to design something smarter than it is. This is just the way microprocessors are designed. You use them to design the next generation. So, uh, that means that within, you know, 
20 years after you have the first thinking machine. You have a thinking machine that's smarter than all humans put together. Now, I don't know what that means for our future. You know, I mean, you might take this as some dystopian. But on the other hand, maybe you can just sit back. Maybe our lives will, will be the pets. I mean, that's not so bad. Pets get to lie around a lot, eat, and sleep. So, but what I'm here to talk to you about in the remaining two minutes is actually what I came here to talk about, which is living your life in space. Now, my particular uh, search which is SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which by the way, S-E-T-I, it's almost my name, that's coincidence, uh, is looking for intelligent life. You know, the kind, the kind of aliens that hold up their side of the conversation, the kind of aliens you see on TV every night in the movies and so on. How many of you think they're out there? All right, how many of you think, no, probably not. All right, you're the ones I want to talk to. Now, <laughs> I'll tell you why I think they're out there. To begin with, they're just a lot of real estate. Maybe that's the end of the story. Right? Jim has uh, said it, well, I, I think it's already been said here a couple times, the universe is big, really big, to quote Douglas Adams. Yes, it is. And, you know, in our galaxy, our galaxy is the Milky Way, which you can't see from Cupertino, but if you go 100 miles somewhere, you might see it. Uh, our Milky Way has a couple of hundred billion stars. Right? But, our best telescopes can photograph a hundred billion other galaxies, each with a couple of hundred billion stars. So that means the number of stars we can see in the part of the universe that's accessible to us, which is you know just a tiny fraction of what's there, is 10,000 billion billion. That's a big number. Now, of course, that doesn't tell you how much life is out there, because after all, life is not going to cook up on stars. It will simply cook. Well, up until very recently, within the last dozen years, we didn't know what fraction of those stars actually had planets. Right? When I was a kid, just before the Civil War broke out, they would tell you in the Hayden Planetarium in New York, they would say, you know, this may be the only place there are planets in the whole galaxy because it's, you know, circumstance of angular momentum. Coming. They would say a whole bunch of stuff, which all, all of which was wrong, by the way. Um, it's not true. We now know, thanks to very, very recent work, that essentially 70% or maybe 80% or maybe more of all stars have planets. Right? Now, in astronomy, 70% is the same as all. Right? In astronomy, pi is equal to 1. Don't let an astronomer do your 1040s, because they won't worry about factors of 2. <laughs> okay. But that's, that's, and, 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 and planets are like uh, kittens. You don't get one. Right? You get a bunch. Right? So, in fact, the number of planets in the universe is maybe roughly five or ten times the number of stars. That means the number of planets in the part of the universe that we can see is comparable to the number of dry grains of sand on all the beaches of Earth. That's that number. Okay, that's a big number. So the five of you who say, you know what, this is the only grain of sand where anything interesting is happening, you have to admire those people and make an effort to sit next to them in the next <laughs> because. They believe this is a miracle, right? Because that's what this would be. This would be a miracle, but like, you know, buying lottery tickets and winning ten times in a row. Right? It's a miracle. Now, I've got to tell you that miracles don't get a whole lot of credence in science. If you're a scientist and you say, this is true because I believe in miracles, you will not get published. <laughs> so, so, the fact that we think they're out there, the alternative to them, not, it, well, put it this way, if they're not out there, this is a miracle. And uh, every time, at least in astronomy, every time we thought we were special, we were wrong. Right? We used to be, you know, the center of the cosmos. Well, actually not. The sun became the center of the cosmos. Well, it turns out the sun is just one of many stars. Oh, well, okay. But we're in the middle of our galaxy. No, that's not right. Okay, our galaxy is the only galaxy. No, that's not right. Every time we thought we were special, we were wrong. I know you like to think you're special because your parents were telling you that for the first 15 years of your life. <laughs> but it may not be true. <laughs> so I'm trying to say, okay, so let me just say, how, given that they're out there, and by the way, recent results, and when I say recent, you know, past couple of weeks, past couple of months, show that you look up at those stars, most of the ones you see with your naked eye are not very interesting, but all the dim ones, which are like the sun, those stars, 20% of them are now estimated to have a planet that could have liquid oceans and an atmosphere. In other words, the kind of planet that could incubate and sustain life. So one in five, that means in our galaxy alone, there are like 50, 100 billion cousins of Earth. And still, they say, this is the only one, right? Again, that would make what's happened here extraordinary, extraordinary. Okay, 
Uh, so how do we find it? Well, I mean, you know, uh, you could just rock it off. That's <laughs> what they do in the movies. Well, just put the pedal to the metal, call up Scotty down in the engine room, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll find him. <laughs> or you could wait for them to come here. Uh, one third of the American public thinks they are here, right? <laughs> Buzz of the countryside. <laughs> I, I expect to be questions about that. I get I get phone calls every day from people who think that they've seen uh, evidence for alien visitation. I don't think they're here, but you know there are plenty of people who do. Uh, that's that's one approach. But the other approach to finding them is to find them in situ. In other words, don't go there. Don't wait for them to come here. We'll just pick them up on the radio. And you may have seen this in the movie Contact. Anybody see the movie Contact? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I can tell you lots of stories. We were, we were consultants for the film, and, and that was amusing, at least. Uh, but the idea, and this is an old idea, it's a half century old idea, is that you get some big antennas, like the one there next to 280, although that's not a very good one for this, but you get some big antennas, you point them in the direction of some nearby stars, and you think, you know, Ralph, that, that probably has planets, right? And then you have very sensitive receivers, tune as much of the radio dial as you can, and try and pick up a signal that would tell you, you know, I don't know what's up there, but it's smart enough to build a radio transmitter. <laughs> That's our definition of intelligence. I get that all the time. What do you mean by intelligence? Is there intelligence here in Cupertino? Is there intelligence inside the Beltway? What? And the answer is, if you can build a radio transmitter for us, you are intelligent. Right? So ask the person sitting next to you, hey, can you build a radio transmitter? And you don't have to treat them for the rest of your tenure here in this club. This might be short. Okay, so that's what we try to do. Now, a question I get a lot at cocktail parties, not that I actually go to cocktail parties, but is, so uh, have you heard of Seth? Have you heard the aliens? So it's a, that's a really a bonkers, but that's a goofy question. Because if we pick them up, you would know. I'd be on my way to Stockholm picking up a prize. <laughs> and then, then, then the second question is usually, well, are you close? Right? Which is just as goofy. How do you know you're close? Right? This is a one bit experiment. It's zero, 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 zero. And then maybe one day it's one. Like pregnancy. You know, are you are you pregnant? No. Are you close? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, so, the, the third question, if there is, usually there's not, usually at that point, whoever's talking to me says, excuse me while I refresh my drink, and walk away. <laughs> but if there is a third question, the third question is, is usually, well, when are you going to find them? That's like asking Chris Columbus two, two weeks out of Cadiz, hey, Chris, when are you going to discover a new continent? I don't know, we just wore around the ship today, yesterday, you know, we're pretty aqueous around the ship. I don't know when I'm going to trip across any continent. Of course, he doesn't know. We don't know either, but I, I dare to make an estimate based on sort of rough guesses as to how many societies might be out there. And they suggest that if this experiment of eavesdropping on ET is going to work, it's going to work in the, the next 20 years. Next 20 years. So, uh, and I usually bet everybody a cup of Starbucks on this, so here's the deal for you. Either within the next 20 years you pick up the newspaper, well, you won't do that. Uh, <laughs> you, you, know, you, open, you open your browser, but, <laughs> and you read, you know, scientists find signal coming from 827 light years away, and you, then you have something to talk about over dinner, or you get a cup of coffee. So that's the um, <laughs> now, let me, let me say a few things that are speculative, unlike the rest of this talk. Uh, about what the aliens might be like and what it would mean to you, the car buyer, if we were to find them. <laughs> to be honest, let me pick that second one first. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, Seth, if you guys actually pick up that signal, you know the feds would come in and shut you down. Right? I, I hear that all the time. I say, why? Why? I mean, what could be more interesting? You'd want every scientist in the world who had the slightest capability to be working on this. And I say, no, 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 the public couldn't handle the news. Well, I ask you, is that true? I mean, if, if you saw this story tomorrow, would you say, that's it, Ralph, I'm not going to work today, I'm just going to ride in the streets. <laughs> I think it's highly unlikely, right? And there are plenty of historical analogs, not to mention false alarms we've had that prove all of that is nonsense. So, in fact, it wouldn't be kept secret. What would happen? I mean, the, the evidence is up in the sky, everybody can find it. It's not. Area 51 or, or something like that. I mean, it's just there, right? So anybody with a big antenna can go find it. What would, what would that do? Well, you might say, well, it depends on what they're saying. If they're saying, 
earth your toast. <laughs> that would be an interesting message, actually. Um, we don't know what the message will be. Because of the nature of the equipment that's used, the incoming signal is average for seconds and minutes, and for the uh, electrical engineers in the audience, you'll know that that throws away all the information. So we won't get the info. That will take a different kind of instrument. But eventually you would build that big instrument, and then maybe you'd get all these bits. Hi, we're the Klingons. We'd like you to join our book club. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what they say? Nobody knows what they say. But they might have you. Know, here's how to get along. And by the way, here's a cure for death, since Seth asked for that. I, whatever. Maybe, maybe. But I think it's much more likely that you get all these bits and nobody ever figures them out. It's like giving a modern digital television signal to Neanderthals. Neanderthals were not stupid. I mean, they're made out to be stupid, but that's because you know they don't have any representation in the in the country anymore. But they were not stupid. They would never, they would never figure out a, a television signal. Right? So we may be in the same situation. But what you would know is that there's somebody out there. That what happened here. This is not a unique experience, the development of biology, biology that eventually evolved into something that could understand the laws of nature, right, and join rotary clubs. That that's not so miraculous. That kind of thing happens. Oh, they don't look like us, they don't behave like us, and they certainly don't speak colloquial English as they always do in the movies, but something analogous may have happened. So that's what it would tell you, and I think that that would calibrate uh, what we are like, and I think that that would be valuable. Let me just say two more things. One, because sometimes I consult for movies, and, 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 and whenever they're doing a, a, a film about aliens, they're likely to call me. And when they do, they only have three questions to say, so Seth, uh, why are the aliens here? Because they, they have to come here, otherwise it's not a very interesting movie. Like they can't destroy L.A. or something. Like, mind you, I mean, here in Northern California, I don't really mind if they destroy L.A. <laughs> okay, so that's what, question one. Question two is, what weapons will they have? Oh, God. I had no idea. I mean, if they're advanced enough to come here. They're thousands of years beyond us. Maybe more. Right? So it's like asking Julius Caesar, hey, uh, Julius, <laughs> what kind of weapons do you think the U.S. military will have in the year 2015? Well, they're going to have really good spears, man. <laughs> I don't know what you say. Whatever he says would be wrong. Okay. And the third question they ask is, what do they look like? Yeah. That's just as nutty as the others. Right? Just walk down to a local zoo, if there is a local zoo. Uh, and, and, and look at, you know, look at those critters. And most of those critters, their DNA is very similar to yours. Very similar. In the case of, you know, the chimps, it's 98.5% identical. But even in the case of a pumpkin, I, I read it somewhere, a pumpkin's DNA is 70% identical to yours. I, I assume that your lifestyle is different than that. <laughs> so, but, you know, you have a lot in common with everything in the zoo. I mean, much closer than, you know, to no pumpkins in there, right? So, it's probably 85, 90% of your DNA is identical to everything in the zoo. But they don't look like you. They look like a fish, you know, a giraffe or a snake or I don't know. So, who's to say what E.T. would look like? But, I return, to the last point to something I said earlier. We are intelligent by our own definition because we can build radio transmitters. But, I also suggested to you that, you know, only 200 years after Marconi, less really, we are going to invent thinking machines. So, it's overwhelmingly likely that if you pick up a signal from the aliens, they've already done that, right? They're not going to be these little soft, squishy gray guys with big eyeballs and no hair and no clothes, like they always are in the movies. That's a, that's a storytelling shortcut. They don't have to give you a big backstory about, hey, these are aliens. You know that right away, they look like aliens, right? I mean, if they look like bicycles, you might wonder, what is that? They have to tell you it's an alien, right? So, but to assume that the model for intelligence in the cosmos is biological, is a bit like, I don't know, maybe the trilobites sitting around and thinking, we're the pinnacle of creation, this is it. This is the best nature can or will do. They'd be wrong, and I think the same is true when we think, you know, thinking mammals or something equivalent to mammals are the best that nature can do. I think if we pick up a signal, uh, you should not be surprised that what's on the other end, behind the microphone at their end, it's not a little gray guy with big eyes, it's another machine. Okay, I'm going to start, stop talking and uh, take your questions. <laughs> Anybody still awake? In the back, yeah. <laughs> How far have our signals traveled since we invented radio 150 years ago? Yeah, how far have our signals got? 
Uh, actually, practical radio dates back to about 1900 or something like that. 1910, 1920 was the first commercial broadcast. But all those early broadcasts were AM, essentially. They were low end of the dial, one megahertz, something like that. Right, they're measured in kilohertz. And all those are very strongly refracted by the ionosphere, so they don't really count. We've been broadcasting effectively into space since the Second World War with the invention of FM, television, and radar, most important radar. Okay, so that's been, what, 70 years, something on that order. So the farthest signals are about 70 light years out. And if you ask how many star systems are within that distance, it's, you know, thousands, not many thousands, a few thousand. And uh, I've worked it out, actually, every day, the earliest episodes of I Love Lucy wash over yet another star system. <laughs> I, I hope they like Fred Mertz's jokes. Yes, ma'am. So have there been any credible Evidence of life on Earth. Has there been any credible evidence of extraterrestrial life here on Earth? In my opinion, no. As I say, one third of the American population disagrees with me. They think that the aliens, 1947, they, they come to New Mexico, to the land of enchantment, right? Presumably to enjoy some Tex Mex cuisine. I don't know why they went there, but whatever. And then in the last, they come, who knows? Hundreds of light years. You understand that's that's like six hundred, hundreds of a hundred light years is six hundred trillion miles. Okay, that's a long way. And then the last fifty feet, they make a navigation error and crash into the dirt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that that could happen, but that's like you doing a cross country you know road trip and then totaling the car in the garage door as you pull in. <laughs> But the evidence is very poor. You hear a lot about this stuff. I've been in, I don't know how many, Fox TV specials. And, you know, I've, I don't know if you none of it would convince me. It doesn't seem to convince many scientists. But a lot of the public is convinced. So, yeah. can I ask a question? How soon do you think we will send artificial intelligence into the space to see? Uh, how soon will we send artificial intelligence into space? I don't know that we have any plans to do that. Uh, I'm not saying that the aliens are going to travel here. Right. But sending AI into space is not something we will do, that's something they will do. Right? If you're really a clever machine, why would you hang around here and get rusted or something? I mean, you just go into space. There are much better energy sources elsewhere. Yes, Solani. Oh, uh, I just have a question. So I heard that someone found the book on Mars. Is that true? Found a which on Mars? A book. Found a book on Mars? Yeah. Was it the Martian Chronicles? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if, if somebody tells you that they found a book on Mars, you know, don't give them your home address. <laughs> if you have no people have been to Mars, there are a lot of rovers going down there, but if they found a book on Mars, nothing, nothing would increase NASA's budget faster to the, uh, to, than to announce some sort of artifact on Mars. There's some, there's some American-made hardware on Mars, you can find that. What is the probability we are surrounded by intelligent signals that we don't know how to read? What's the probability that we're surrounded by intelligent signals but we don't know how to detect them, I suppose you mean? Uh, you're asking, what's the probability that there's something happening that we don't know about? It's kind of hard to answer now, isn't it? <laughs> I'll just reckon that probability this way. Well, nobody can say. I mean, you know, they're, they're, look, what you don't know, you don't know. Basically. But if you say, what's the probability that there are signals that we do know about, like light, radio, electromagnetic radiation? You know, they're just falling through our bodies if you sit here. Yeah, that probability could be high, but they're not strong enough for us to have detected them so far. That's all you can say. Yeah? Good yeah, question. Actually, because I saw like my roommate uh, designed the first amplifier for the bike lander of Mars, so we was involved in that early on. But the question is this Have you addressed the protocol that if you do announce that you have, uh, irreparably, if you found evidence of life? The way you announce it to the world, this would be a tad unsettling to say the least. You talked about it or your procedure, but you do find it. I don't think I heard all that, but you're asking is there a protocol? Yeah. What to do if you find a signal? Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the International Academy of Astronautics that uh, you mentioned there, that was one of the things that our committee did. Uh, there, there are these protocols, but they have no force of law. And they say very little. What they say, I mean, it's multi pages, but what it actually says is if you find a signal, first thing you do is verify it. That it's for real, okay, and that that in the end involves calling up somebody at another installation and say you look for it, right? You wouldn't believe it if you were the only ones to find it. I mean, it could be a you know Stanford undergraduate prank, <laughs> maybe a Berkeley undergraduate, whatever. Okay, so the second thing it says is you tell everybody, 
And the third thing it says is don't broadcast anything back until you've had some international consultation so nobody feels cheated that you're talking to them exclusively. <laughs> kind of nutty, but, yeah. uh, but however, however, despite the fact that these uh, protocols get a lot of play, that people find it interesting, I can tell you that they're largely irrelevant. We had in 1997, we found a signal that we thought for most of the day was the real deal. And, you know, so there we are. Of course, everybody is, you know, sending emails to their boyfriends and girlfriends. Well, hey, Marge, don't tell anybody, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, and there's no policy of secrecy. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing is I began looking around. You know, are the feds going to show up and shut us down? <laughs> no interest in the feds whatsoever. Even the mayor of Mountain View, whom I knew, he didn't even call up. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. Until 9 o'clock in the morning, we'd been up all night looking at this thing. You know, and, and my head's down on my desk and the phone rings, and it's somebody who does call out care. And it was one of the science reporters from the New York Times. They already knew about it. This was 15, 15 hours into it. So that's what really happens. What really happens is you're still not sure because it takes you days to check it out. But the media are on top of the story essentially immediately. And the less reputable media are going to run with the story first. The New York Times didn't run the story because I told the guy, look, we're checking it out. I'll call you back in three hours after which we kind of knew it wasn't for real. But if that had been the weekly world news, you think they would have even bothered to call me? They would have just run with the story. So if if we find aliens, you'll read about it first in the checkout line at Safeway. <laughs> 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 for sure. What is the level of I guess you're asking, how big is this effort? Yeah, yeah it's very small. It's extremely small. There's no federal funding for SETI in the United States. It hasn't been for 20, more than 20 years now. Uh, the total number of people in the world who are doing this kind of an experiment right, is fewer than are sitting in that middle table there. It's very small. In fact, the only other projects, SETI projects besides our own, uh, is UC Berkeley. They have a very clever project. They do really great work, I would say. There's a uh, what's called an optical study. They're looking for flashing lights. Uh, experiment at Harvard, and it's like two people. Like that. And then there's an experiment in Italy at the University of Bologna. That's it. That is it. More people that work at the In and Out Burger near where I live. Let me go first. Do you have a favorite alien visitation movie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> say that my favorite sci-fi film of all time, because I saw it when I was very young, was the original War of the Worlds, because I thought it had real terror, right? mind you. And, and, and the producer, George Powell, was clever enough not to show the aliens very much. That's a big mistake. The remake wasn't quite as good. But beyond that, look, I, I go to every sci-fi film, I must say. Um, yeah, I do. I, if, if for nothing else than for the amusement back I, would, I was a science consultant for the remake of the day the earth stood still, they should never have remade it. Anybody ever see that? Michael Rennie? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what people do with your own plan. Michael Rennie could have read the, you know, the Cupertino phone book. That would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've heard recently, um, I believe that you read in Battle of a possible um, visit from the state for astronauts on Mars and in the future, where they're going to stay and you know, build the habitat. Would that impact the study in any way? Yeah, uh, I, I think you're referring to the project called Mars One. Yeah. And this is an initiative of a guy uh, just outside on Amsterdam, uh, Bas Lonsdorp is his name. And uh, he had 200,000 people apply to be on the first rocket to go to Mars. The deal is, it's a one-way ticket. Yeah. Right? How many of you would go on a one-way ticket to Mars? Yeah. See, it's not zero. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, the idea is not that you go up there and then expire. The idea is you go up there and then turn into a colonist. It's like, it's, it's like leaving Holland and, and, and coming to Plymouth Rock in 1620, right? They're not sending you there to die, they're sending you there to colonize. Okay, so that's the idea. Actually, uh, you mentioned our radio show, uh, Big Picture Science, and if you listen to this week's show, you can find it on the web, look up Big Picture Science. The, the first interview is with a young woman, she's a senior at uh, Duke, 
University, and she's one of the 100 finalists. And so, of course, he asked her, you know, what does your mom think of the fact that you're going to go to Mars on a one-way ticket? That kind of thing. Uh, I don't know that it's terribly practical, because they don't have any rockets. It's, it's nice to assemble all these people who want to go, but that doesn't get you there. And, and, and Mars is a very tough environment, I want you to know. If you look at the pictures, it kind of looks like Arizona without the cacti. <laughs> but it's not. It's not. There's no air you can breathe. There's very little air in general. There's no liquid water, right? And uh, average temperatures are like minus 50. It's not. It's not all that easy a place. You'd have to have artificial habitats. I mean, you can do it, and we will do it. But it's not. It's not easy. Let me take one more question because I can tell you're getting stultified. Yes. Does it have anything to do with R2D2? Sorry. Does it have anything to do with R2D2? Do I have anything to do with R2D2? Is it a personal friend or <laughs> living in my house? Did you design and help design Hollywood design R2D2? Oh, yeah, no, I think R2D2, I mean, he's, what I like about him is he push him over and he'll roll down a hill. <laughs> no, I, I haven't had anything to do with R2D2. I did have something to do with the guy who played the, uh, the robot in Lost in Space. Uh, yeah, was, I think his last name was May. And uh, I was on a TV show called To Tell the Truth. He was one of the other impersonators. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.